Okay, good afternoon everybody, um, welcome back. Um, I'm Kate Pickett, I'm Professor of Epidemiology in the Department of Health Sciences here at the University of York. I'm also one of the university's research champions, I'm the champion for justice and equality, and I'm also the Deputy Director of the Centre for Future Health, which is um, running this event today. Um, and I'm delighted, I have real pleasure in introducing our keynote speaker this afternoon, Professor Sir Michael Marmot. Um, Michael and I actually were both social epidemiologists and we were both trained by the same person, um, Len Syme at the University of California at Berkeley, who I think is sort of one of the founding fathers of the discipline. And I first saw um, Michael speak at the University of Chicago, which was mentioned in our earlier session. I think you must just have received your knighthood because my colleague who introduced you said he didn't find it too challenging because he'd been brought up to call every adult male sir all of his life, as Americans do. Um, Michael is the author of important books in our subject, Status Syndrome and the Health Gap, but perhaps is even better known for his um, landmark reports on the social determinants of health, both globally, regionally, um, and within the UK. In fact, his 2010 report to the government on health, the state of health inequalities in our nation, although it was called Fair Society, Healthy Lives, is always known as the Marmot Review. Um, it's really an important time for us to be talking about the social determinants of health and health inequalities at the moment in this country, because we are going backwards, and I know Michael is going to talk about some of those statistics. Our public health is declining, and our health inequalities are growing. Um, we are in the bottom right-hand corner of the chart that Susan showed us earlier, where population health on average is getting worse and health inequalities are increasing. And it is our government that has placed us there. So this is an apposite, important time to be hearing from Michael, um, and it's a real privilege to introduce him to you today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk today more about the UK picture than I am about global health, but some other time I'm happy to talk about that. I have, though, spent a bit of time talking to doctors. I spent a year as president of the World Medical Association, and in trying to get doctors and national medical associations concerned about the social determinants of health. I said the first line of my book, The Health Gap, was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. A young relative of mine asked me not long ago, is anyone listening to you? <laughs> I thought, that youngster's got a bright future. <laughs> he knows how to ask the right question. So uh, I'm going to start with a bit of self-indulgence on the question, is anybody listening? The Italians translated my book into La Salute Disuguale. Um, only the Italians would have me on the cover of the book like that. <laughs> and for the health e economics people at York, the Trento, Festival of Economics in Northern Italy a couple of years ago had as the theme of their summer festival La Salute Disuguale. And they invited me to come and talk and I'd quite forgotten that that was the theme. And I saw these signs all over the town <laughs> saying La Salute Disuguale and I thought that's the title of my book. And then I saw this cardboard <laughs> And I had to have the photo taken next to the cardboard. I sent it to my children, and one of my sons came back and said, I think the cutout looks better than the original. <laughs> and then somebody posted this. Crossword of La Repubblica magazine, 146 down, the clue. British physician, founder of social epidemiology, if you can see, Marmot. Now, I haven't got a place in my curriculum vitae for 
being in an Italian crossword, but it is kind of an evidence-based answer to my young relative who said, who asked, is anybody listening? Yeah, well, I pity the people who tried to solve the crossword puzzle that day. <laughs> Kate referred to this, the danger that we're in the bottom, I think, as you look at it, left, the bottom left quadrant. Um, <laughs> could you discuss that later? <laughs> Since I published the Marmot Review in 2010, we've been monitoring health, health inequalities, and the social determinants of health in Britain, actually in England, uh, and we've been putting out reports every year and a half or so. And in 2017, when we put this one out, we pointed to the fact, this is, goes back to 1980-82, but if we went back to 1920, at the end of World War I. From 1920 to 2011, life expectancy improved at approximately one year every four years for men and for women. Six hours every 24 hours. Wow. And then in 2011, it stopped. Well, nearly stopped. At the time, there was a piece in the Sunday Times saying, don't blame Tory cuts, and saying professors should be careful about shooting their mouths off. Now, when I was asked, was it due to austerity, I said, I don't know. I do know that NHS expenditure didn't rise in line with historical trends. Historically, it was about 3.8% a year increase, and from 2010 on, it was more like 1% a year. And that the adult component of social care spending went down by 6% at a time when the population over 65 increased by 16%. And both of those, the decline in health care expenditure and the decline in social care expenditure, will have an adverse impact on the quality of life of older people but I don't know whether it shortened the lives of older people, but it is urgent to try and find out. I wrote to the health secretary, Jeremy Junt, <coughs> Jeremy Hunt, uh, you'll know the reference. Um, <laughs> I wrote to the health secretary and said, this is a health crisis. You should take this as seriously as you would a winter bed crisis. He did. He ignored them both. <laughs> it's not quite what I had in mind. But a year later, so the, the man who said, don't blame Tory cuts, said it could be a bad winter, it could be the flu, it could be an artifact, it could be obesity. He knew that it was nothing to do with austerity. I was surprised he had such certainty. I didn't know what the reason was, but I thought it was urgent that we try and investigate. But now it's getting worse. And if you agree with the general proposition that the health of a population tells us something fundamental about how well that population is doing, the fact that health stopped improving and health inequalities, which I'll show you in a moment, increased, means something's going wrong. And in England, life expectancy nearly ground to a halt, going down for men in Northern Ireland, going down for men and women in Scotland, going down for men and women in Wales. This is terrible. We expect health to improve every year. That's what we've been used to since the end of the World, World War I. And now it isn't anymore. Something is going terribly wrong. And this is a measure of health inequality, um, the slope index of inequality, and it's rising for males and rising for females. So we are in that bottom left quadrant, getting worse, 
inequalities increasing. Does the USA represent the future? I had this slide looking at the fact that life expectancy in the US declined two years in a row. I was sitting at a meeting in Hong Kong in November, got a call from the BBC World Service in London. They didn't quite know where I was. Uh, I wasn't sure where I was either. But, um, and they said the news, this was November, from CDC was that life expectancy in the US had declined three years in a row. Big increase in unintentional injuries, which includes accidental drug overdoses, 63,600 deaths, and the new figures, 70,000 deaths last year from drug overdoses. If you add in 32,000 deaths from firearms, that's 100,000 deaths that really should not occur. Now, we don't have the same opioid crisis. These have been labeled in the US deaths of despair. I do think we have deaths of despair. We just don't have the opioid addictions in the same way. But the question is, is this our future? Is that where we're going? And if we look at life expectancy inequalities in the US, this is life expectancy at 50 by year of birth and income. So people whose year of birth was 1920 were 50 in 1970. There's the social gradient, and it is a remarkable social gradient. Each decile of income, better life expectancy. Over the next 30 years, life expectancy at 50, pretty flat for the poorest 10%, improved a bit for the next 10%, a bit more, a bit more, a bit more, a bit more. So the gradient got much steeper. The inequalities got much bigger. That's men. I don't know if you've had a bad week or you okay, you're feeling resilient. Can I show you the figures for women? <laughs> I think perhaps I ought to get informed consent before I show you the next slide. Life expectancy is going down for the bottom 10% in women, for the second decile in women, for the third bottom decile in women, for the bottom 30% of the distribution, life expectancy is getting worse. And the gradient's getting dramatically steeper. And the inequality is getting bigger. Is this our future? If we look at UNICEF report card 14, at young people, they've got an index of neonatal mortality suicide, age 0 to 19, mental health, ages 11 to 15, drunkenness at ages 11 to 15, and rank OECD countries. And there's the US. That's kind of the average. There's the US, the UK, and for almost everything I look at, we're kind of ordinary. Not terribly good, not the worst, just ordinary. What an ambition to have as a country. <laughs> it's like our cricket team. <laughs> and one of the important points to make is that the mind is not the only gateway, but an important gateway by which social determinants affect ill health, impacts on mental illness and well-being, and psychosocial pathways to physical illness, behaviors, stress pathways. And you see that in the US with deaths of despair, suicide, drugs, and alcohol. We also see that health inequalities vary dramatically. I've shown you that they can increase over time quickly. They also vary across country from our European report, 
we look at life expectancy at age 25 in 15 European countries. ISCED 0 to 2 is the international social classification of education. 0 to 2 is primary education and 5 to 6 is tertiary education. So there's Sweden, long life expectancy and a relatively narrow gap between those with tertiary education and those with primary education. Estonia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, the former communist countries, lower average and a huge gap. The inequalities get much bigger in the former communist countries of Europe than they are um, in Sweden, Italy, Norway, Malta, Denmark. Another way of describing it is that the disadvantage of being in Estonia is really quite small if you've got university education. The high status people are not suffering from being in an unhealthy country. The low status people are suffering enormously. If you think health is a matter of personal choice, then Whatever you do, choose to have a Swedish mother, not an Estonian mother. <laughs> but if you're stupid enough to choose to be born in Estonia, not Sweden, make sure you get a university education, because that'll counteract the ill effect of being in Estonia or Hungary, to a large extent. I want to introduce a second idea which is a bit challenging to hold two ideas in my head at the same time. But it's a theme that Kate and Richard have covered. And I want to talk about crime. In The Health Gap, I wrote about Baltimore. The life expectancy gap in Baltimore between the rich part, Roland Park, and the small part, the, the poor part, Upton Druid, the life expectancy gap is 20 years. If you're, for men, if you're a man living in Roland Park in Baltimore and you want to see what it's like to live where the life expectancy is 20 years shorter, you could fly to Ethiopia, not on a Boeing 737 MAX. Um, you could fly to Ethiopia. Alternatively, you could go a few kilometers across town to Upton Druid, where the life expectancy is 20 years shorter. And I wrote about what it's like to be there, half a single parent family's median household income in 2010 was $17,000. The kids do poorly in school. But look at this. Each year, a third of young people aged 10 to 17 are arrested for a juvenile disorder. One third each year. The chance of getting to age 18 without having been in trouble with the police is quite small. In theory, the slate is wiped clean at 18. So you go for a job and they ask, have you ever been in trouble with the police? You could lie which is not a very good qualification. For, well, actually, it gets you to the White House. But, <laughs> but for normal people, it's not a good. Or you could tell the truth. Yeah, I got arrested every couple of years, which is not a good qualification for a job. And in 2000, there were 100 non-fatal shootings for every 10,000 residents, and nearly 40 homicides in these young people. And in Roland Park, two-parent families, high income, the kids do well in school. Juvenile arrests, one in 50, not one in three. No non-fatal shootings and four homicides, not 40. So the same area that has poor health has a high rate of crime. I've been showing this graph a long time ago, when the summer riots happened in London in 2011. And I'd been showing that um, Tottenham Green had life expectancy for men of 71 years, 
Kensington and Chelsea, Queensgate Ward, 88 years. Where did the summer riots break out? No, not in Kensington and Chelsea. In Tottenham, where one of my sons lives, um, in Tottenham. And it was reported that of young people who were arrested in the riots, 91% were not in education, employment, or training at a time when the national figure was about 11%. Young people with a stake in the future don't go out and riot. There were no trainee lawyers, accountants, young doctors rioting. They were people who were not in employment, education, or training, which is a potent predictor of ill health. Going further afield, in Australia they have the social gradient in health, but they're particularly concerned when they think about inequalities at the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Life expectancy gap on average, 10.6 years for men, 9.4 years for women. And on trips to Australia, I got interested in health of Indigenous Australians. And I was taken to Alice Springs, and then Alice Springs looks like the big smoke. We went two hours outside Alice Springs in the Northern Territory to Arayonga. Council office, health clinic, store, that's it. Parenthetically, in the health clinic, they showed me proudly the health education advice they give the Aboriginal patients to prevent obesity and diabetes. Eat fruit and vegetables. We're in the middle of the desert. Do you know how much an apple costs in Alice Springs? What it would be like to try and get a piece of fruit in Arayonga, and they're telling people to eat fruit and vegetables? But the real issue, this is the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory. This building looms over the whole of Atlas Springs. You're just conscious of the Supreme Court wherever you look. The incarceration rate among Indigenous Australians in the Northern Territory is 2,400 per 100,000. For the non-Indigenous, it's 186, a 13-fold difference. 84% of the prison population is indigenous compared to 27% of the general population. And diagnosed mental illness in prisoners, 72% in the men and 92% in the women. What a thing to do to damage young people. Put them in prison. Now that's a great way you're talking about mental health. Yeah, get them out of the, inst the institutions, put them in another institution, prison. What an appalling thing to do. If you didn't have mental illness when you went in there, if you survive it, you will when you come out. By the way, the incarceration rate, there's the UK at about 140 per 100,000. In Japan, 48. And in the US, 700 per 100,000. And the incarceration rate, we've shown, has an impact on mortality and life expectancy. So I got in a bit interested in this issue of crime and mental illness. I looked up some figures in Denmark, violent offending, 10% of males and 26% of females have mental illness. UK figures, 80% of all criminal activity attributed to people who had conduct problems in childhood and adolescence. Now, I haven't done a very rigorous study of it, but whether the figure is 10% or 80% of people in prison have mental illness, it's a lot. Some say it's around half people in prison have mental illness. Therefore, prevent mental illness in children. We know that half of the lifetime onset of mental illness happens by the age of 14. 
prevent mental illness in children, they'll have better mental health for the rest of their lives, they'll have better physical health for the rest of their lives, and they'll be less likely to end up in prison. And that brings me to, well, okay, what can we do? So as you heard from Kate, I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. We called our report Closing the Gap in a Generation, and related to the way the last session ended, we gave the moral case. We said reducing health inequalities is a matter of social justice. In fact, we said on the cover of the report of the Global Commission, social injustice is killing on a grand scale. And then in the wake of the WHO Commission, I was asked to do the Marmot Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. We did a European review of social determinants and the health divide. And we, last week, we sent the final report to PAHO, they'll come back, but uh, of our commission of the Pan American Health Organization on Equity and Health Inequalities in the Americas. We called it Just Societies, Health Equity and Dignified Lives. In my English review, we had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions, having enough money to lead a healthy life, healthy and sustainable places to live and work, and a social determinants approach to prevention. And I want to touch on just a couple of these. I said I was going to talk about the UK, but we get data from where we can find them. It relates to the work we're doing in the Americas, looking at the percent of preschool enrollment. So our children enrolled in preschool in order to improve readiness for school. And that's the solid line. In Cuba, 100% of children are enrolled in preschool at ages three to five. In Costa Rica, it's around 90%. In Chile, it's over 80%. At the other end, Paraguay, Dominican Republic, much lower percentages enrolled in preschool. The dotted line are reading scores in the sixth grade. And they overlap. The higher the enrollment in preschool, the better the reading scores in the sixth grade. And we've done this for the whole of the Americas. And you can see by country, those countries that have higher enrollment in preschool have better PISA scores, the Program of International Student Assessment, age 15. And Cuba, Costa Rica, and Chile have the longest life expectancy. That's not proof of causation, but it's consistent with a life course model. Invest in preschool, better performance in school, more likely to get qualifications, have a better job, higher income, better conditions, and the countries have better life expectancy. We know a potent predictor of poor early child development is child poverty. If we look at different countries where child poverty is a relative measure, is defined as less than 60% median income, there's Denmark, 9%, Iceland, 10%, Norway, 10%, Finland, Republic of Korea. That's what it can be. The UK, just under 20%. United States, 29%, just below Mexico. We know how to reduce child poverty. The Minister of Finance can reduce child poverty through operation of the tax and benefit system. I've challenged American audiences and colleagues say this must be the level of child poverty that you want. Otherwise, you'd vote for a government that did something different. And they elected Trump. 
I mean, the, the biggest, you know, when he boasts about America's the best that it's ever been and no one's ever done, does he know that they're getting sicker? That they're dying? Does he know or care about child poverty? That's the real obscenity, not what he does with porn actresses, but the fact that child poverty is at 29%. And has he ever mentioned it? Has somebody commented, you know, that New Zealand's Prime Minister, she should be playing golf and enriching herself rather, you know, doing what you expect leaders to do rather than expressing empathy with people, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> And social mobility, this from, from the OECD, I apologize, slightly complicated. So it's the percent of per persons in the bottom and top quartile with a father in the bottom quartile of earnings. So look at the US. If you're in the top quartile of earnings, you're very unlikely to have had a father in the bottom quartile. In other words, if your father was in the bottom quartile, just forget it. This is not the land of opportunity. You're stuck down there. You're going to end up in the same quartile that your dad did. And if you're in the bottom quartile, you're overwhelmingly likely to have had a father in the bottom quartile. Look at Denmark. No difference. It's about 25% in each case. That's what it could be. There's a graph in the spirit level that looks a bit like that. The Gini coefficient and social mobility. I think you'll graph the other way around, but it's the same thing. Um, it's the higher the income inequality, the less social mobility. And one of the roots to that is education. In the US, for example, and I won't fill your mind with it all now. But in the US, what we see is if your father had university education, you're much more likely to have it. And if your father didn't, you weren't. Whereas in the Nordic countries, much more mobility. It's much more fluid. I said that my fifth recommendation was about healthy and sustainable places to live and work. Often, I've been asked, what's the one thing you would recommend? And my response is, if I thought there was only one thing, I would have only had one recommendation. <laughs> I had six. You can, you know, I know you need two hands to count the six. But they're interrelated. They're interrelated. So, for example, in London, 17% of people are in poverty, in childhood, poverty, 17%, before housing costs, after housing costs, 37%. Housing is causing poverty. And poverty is causing lack of, uh, for lack of healthy housing. We did a report on fuel poverty, growing up in cold homes, and respiratory problems, but we said more than one in four adolescents living in cold housing are at risk of multiple mental health problems. And cold housing negatively affects children's educational attainment, emotional well-being, and resilience. In my years, president of the British Medical Association, the chair of council at the time, so I can't do a Scottish accent, but he said, you know, ah, when I was a lad, you know, growing up in Edinburgh, that we had ice on the inside of the windows. You can't tell me that that's damaging intellectual capacity. I said, Hamish, could you imagine what you could have achieved if you'd grown up in a warm home? <laughs> <laughs> and when we look at private rental, in regions, the quality of housing is worse in social than in the social rental sector. And in London, it was something like 38% in 
were in the social rental sector, and it's now down to about 24%. That was the right to buy policy, selling off social housing and not replacing it. And private rentals gone from nothing to 28% in London. It's expensive and it's poor quality. And then green space, the more deprived the area, the less access to green space. We know that exercising in green space is good for mental health and it's good for physical health. My demise as a serious, sci as serious scientist is now official. The Lancet sends me off to photo exhibitions and I published last Saturday in The Lancet a review of Bedrooms of London. And it is at the Foundling Museum in London. Photographs of what it's like to be homeless, growing up homeless in crowded bedrooms. And there's text that go with it. Emily Martin and their baby sleep on the sofa bed in the living room where they eat. The other three children in the bedroom. Martin's working. He earns 800 pounds a month. Outside, the older kids compete for drugs clientele. They leave knives in the bushes where younger children play hide and seek. Three teenage children and one nine-year-old sleep in this bedroom. Both parents work, but they still have to have their rent subsidized. The area is full of gangs, says the mother. I want my children to live in a safe place. There are kids around the building who don't go to school. So they've got this crowded accommodation, but she won't let her children play outside because she's worried about what will happen to them. As I commented on this one, this one has everything and the kitchen sink. <clears throat> Emily's partner left when she was five months pregnant and she said, at the beginning, I didn't have benefits, so I didn't have food. I was crying for no reason. For no reason. She puts a towel under the door to stop the weed smoke from getting in. They're in a hostel. Her child is the only child in this hostel. Everyone's smoking weed. <sighs> Growing up in accommodation like this, a Nigerian mother, an English father, and three children, and she said, to know that somebody somewhere is making something available for you to be happy. My feeling welcome in this country has been all through charities. Now, I talk about the social gradient, but this is what's happening at the bottom end. And Shelter says that one third of people in England are one paycheck away from homelessness. That's how fragile we are. Cold homes, crowded. I talk about adverse child experiences. How could you avoid adverse child experiences when everyone's crowded on top of each other? And you know adverse child experiences include physical abuse, psychological abuse, sexual abuse, drunkenness, etc. in parents. Are these people feckless? Are the poor? The architects of their own misfortune. One mother said, nobody falls into this on purpose because your whole life is going to be a trap. A trap. And then you'll see yourself living a life you never thought you would. People are supposed to look after themselves. Public Health England gives them healthy eating advice. If people in the bottom 10% of household income followed Public Health England's healthy eating advice, they would spend 74% of their income on food. Housing is a food issue. 
people living in these, when we did the cold homes report, people were making the choice whether to heat or eat. Now they're making the choice whether to pay the rent or eat. I interviewed a mother and her 12-year-old daughter, the Food Foundation put on an event. I did a sort of public interview. And I said, I had figures that only 18, 18, 1, 8 percent of people in England had as many as one meal a day at a table. Was this your experience? And the 12-year-old girl said, well, I, I have friends very different. The posh ones sit down at table with their family every night. But the others sit on the floor, eat whatever's going. So think about the quality of family interaction. Think about food and the like. And similar figures for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. But I have good news. That's the bad news. Coventry is a marmot city. They've taken my six domains and they say, we're going to do it in Coventry. And they are doing it. And we're now working with them on an evaluation. And the indicators are moving in a good direction. I went to Trieste in Italy. They said, we are an Italian marmot city. Really? And then I was invited to Bologna. And the person who invited me, I said, do they know they're an Italian marmot city? Well, no, of course not. We just said that to get you there. But in, <laughs> but in Bologna, they said to me, if we declare ourselves a marmot city, will you come back? Well, OK, all right. Twist my arm. So people are taking up these recommendations and trying to apply them. I said I was interested in the health of indigenous Australians. In Mount Druid, in Western Sydney, I was taken to a shed. It's called the shed. And it was set up to prevent Aboriginal men committing suicide. One of the co-founders of the shed when I arrived, he said, this place is dedicated to you, to me. What do you mean? He said, conventional wisdom is that men get depressed and commit suicide because they won't talk about their feelings. We took the view that it's because of the social determinants of health, because children are being removed from families because of homelessness, because of unemployment, marginalization. I was told these stories of child removal, isolation, depression. This man told me about he'd moved down from northern New South Wales to Sydney to get work. His partner was doing drugs and abusing the children. He beat her up. They separated. And then childcare services came in and said, we'll take the children away. And he got depressed and was on the edge of taking his life and was saved by the shed. I met the lawyer who was fighting to try and get his children restored. And in fact, the next day, I had dinner, well, I went to Melbourne, and I had dinner with a group called Vacho, the Victorian, Victorian Aboriginal Vacho, community-controlled healthcare organisations. Ten chief executives, all Indigenous Australians, and I had to give a little dinner talk, and I said, my understanding is it, takes, it costs $100,000 a year to take a child into care. Nobody thinks it's a good idea that a child should be brought up with parents who are abusing drugs and alcohol and beating them up and neglecting them. But surely for $100,000 a year 
maybe you could work to try and work with the families and deal with the alcohol and drug problems to keep families together. Because we know taking child, children into care is disastrous for them. And one woman said, we're doing it in Ballarat, a small town in Victoria. We've taken the responsibility for these children, so it's on our heads if something goes wrong, and we work with the families. She said apologetically, we haven't done a cost-benefit analysis. Well, okay, never mind. But it's inspiring that despite these dreadful circumstances, Aboriginal people are getting involved in organising their communities and making a difference. They do need resources, but it needs the community organisation. And while I'm on the good news, with our PAHO report, we've now convened a health equity network in the Americas, which will be set up with these various partners to take our report forward across the Americas. Remember, we said on the cover of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, social injustice is killing on a grand scale. And I've been saying we need evidence-based policies. I saw a slide earlier this afternoon, evidence-informed policies. OK, that'll do. Evidence-based policies presented in a spirit of social justice. And if I can do the unpardonable and quote myself from, <laughs> from our report from the Americas, at the heart of the Commission's purpose is ensuring the right of all people in the Americas to lead lives of dignity and enjoy the highest attainable standard of health. We call on all governments to act. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I, I found the notion that we might be facing a future that looks like the US quite depressing. I remember when I, when I was living and working and researching there, I used to feel a little bit smug about not being an American. Um, I used to think, we don't have food banks, you know, and this kind of thing. And the rapidity with which um, our society has changed and the speed with which our health gains and our health inequality reductions are reversed is really shocking. So I'm glad you at least ended on some, some optimistic notes. But it struck me that, that you're finding what, what we have also found with our work, that there are lots of local initiatives that are doing really quite amazing things. And at international level, there's quite a lot of traction and, and discussion. But if we look at our national governmental level, it's just so hard. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about what we can be doing or how, how we might approach things differently. Well, I, I am, I have to say, an optimist, and I like to say an evidence-based optimist. Um, and my approach is I go around pushing on doors. If they don't open, I don't beat on the door. I just find another door that will open. So where we get national governments that are interested, we go to Costa Rica, go to Colombia, uh, go to Peru. Uh, in our current American work, before the government changed in Brazil, we went to Brazil, and the national governments were interested. They wanted to do things. Where they're not interested, we work at a different level. We go to civil society organizations, or we go to sub-national government. So in the US, excuse me, there's a great deal of interest at the city level a great deal happening at this, not much at the state level, but much more at the city level, huge enthusiasm. The American Medical Association was on the phone to me yesterday. They want to do a webinar with doctors on social determinants of health. I thought the American Medical Association was somewhere, you know, way off in the right hand end of the spectrum. Um, but they want to know what doctors can do to address social determinants of health. So we work where we can. And in the UK, there's actually quite a lot of interest in the Welsh government, mm -hmm. so at the government level in Wales. 
at the government level in Scotland, a bit less so in Northern Ireland, but quite a lot of interest. Um, but in England, we're working at the city level. I mentioned um, Coventry as a Marmot city. We're working with Manchester. There's interest from Gateshead. When we did the report, there were seven cities that said they wanted to be Marmot cities. And I mentioned about the Italian initiative. Uh, you know, go on. Uh, the Italians used to be embarrassed by their government. Um, now they look at the UK and say, well, you know. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but there's a lot of interest at city level. OK, let's open up for questions. I have a question from Sanjoy down here at the front. Microphone's coming down towards you on that side. There we go. So, uh, Maria Nero was in charge before the big reform of environment and social determinants of health. So I've truly lost track. So which division in the WHO is now going to make sure that social de determinants remains um, at play? Well, um, I'm very careful not to attribute cause and effect, but <coughs> uh, Dr. Tedros invited me to come and meet him, which I did in January. And he said he would like me to be his advisor on social determinants of health. I did point out that it was kind of invisible in Geneva. Uh, and I said, I'm careful not to attribute cause and effect between our conversation and what he did next. But what he did next in his reorganization, people have said it's a bit ambiguous. The bit I like is he cre created a whole new cluster on healthy lives because, you know, he had this thing for three billions, a billion more people getting health coverage, a billion more people being covered by emergency preparedness, and a billion more people with healthy lives. And he created a new cluster with healthy lives, Mar Maria Nera and Environment, a Department of Social Determinants of Health. I don't know who's the chair yet, and say oh, I'm going there on Monday, and then a Department of Health Promotion. So, and that's quite good, I think, because it's not saying that social determinants of health is just health promotion, and it's not really just in part of environment. It's saying there's environment, there's social determinants of health, and health promotion. So it's giving it much more visibility, which has to be a good thing. Okay, looking around, see a hand. Okay, I think maybe we've tired everybody out. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to, to come to York. Um, it's been a great day. I think you've given us a lot um, to think about, and we're very grateful to you. So if we could all thank Michael for spending his time with us today. Um, and I'd now like to introduce um, Debbie Smith, who is our Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, who will close the conference for us this afternoon. <laughs> So good afternoon everyone. Um, it's a real privilege to have the chance to say a very short number of words at the end of what I think has been a brilliant conference. And I would say particularly that Michael's presentation has been inspirational, I think, to many people in this room. I don't know from it, two points, Michael. One is that we heard earlier the importance of being apolitical in everything we do. And of course, that is a hugely valid point. But when you hear some of the data, you see some of the data presented, that's quite difficult sometimes for some of us to think that we should always be apolitical. But the second thing I would say is that, you know, let's have an ambition that York should be a Marmot city. Why not? You know, we have a, a medium-sized city that should be ambitious. We should be working with our local council and we should really be pushing the agenda here. So I think that's something we should investigate and we should try to take forward. We would all be inspired to try to make that happen. And I can see some uh, smiles around the room, and some of us know that it's quite difficult to work with our local council, but I suspect everybody finds that, so let's not give up on that challenge. Just wanted to say a few words about the organisation today and to thank a few people, but firstly I'll say that whoever came up with the idea of amalgamating the university's research impact conference 
and the Centre for Future Health Conference, both annual events, to put them into one piece, I thought was great. It was a fantastic idea. I don't know if it was Alex, I don't know if it was Kate, Philip, I don't know who did it, but I think it was a great idea to bring together these two really distinct areas of our activity, which are so interrelated. So we've heard a lot about fantastic innovation and really uh, thought-provoking policy, bringing them together. Um, some of the words I've picked up as I've sat there listening to the presentations, you know, common themes, the importance of partnerships and beneficiaries, the importance of co-production and co-delivery of activity with our partners, access and curation of the mind-blowingly large amounts of data now, putting it to good use for the future in innovative ways. Um, the role of evidence-based policy, that's come up time and time again. So these common themes that we all think about in different ways really are the glue that bring together the world-class research and knowledge transfer that we do here, and we should absolutely continue doing that. And I think the Centre for Future Health, when we came up with that name, again, I can't remember who exactly came up with that name, but it was really insightful because this is the future of our health and well-being, and that is just so important for us for the local region, for the country, for the global environment and policy. So I think all of those things are, are, are really incredibly important and bring together the value of having an event like that. So let me just say a few thanks then, because this event, these types of events don't happen without the work of a lot of people. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers who've really entertained and been thought-provoking and given us brilliant expositions of their activities, particularly our visitors, Robert and Michael. Thank you both for coming and to all of our internal speakers, um, all of our exhibition holders outside from the university and from our partner organisations, our early career researchers who put on some fantastic posters outside and I hope many of you have a chance to look at those. And I have the privilege of announcing the winner of the competition for the best poster. I don't know who the judges were, Alex, and you're not going to tell me. But anyway, there were some judges. And the winner actually happens to be one of our Centre for Future Health fellows, and that is Michael Bottery. Michael, are you here? <laughs> And for those of you who did see his poster, or perhaps you didn't, it was on cystic fibrosis and the microbiota and some of the really uh, innovative research he's doing in that area. And apparently there's a prize on the way, Michael, but it's not here now, which sounds rather typical. Blame Alex and find Alex afterwards and he'll tell you how to access the prize. So I'd like to also then thank our organisers. Um, Kate, I don't think she left because uh, of this uh, speech, but I think it was because they have a train to catch, or Michael has a train to catch, but Alex and Kate as directors of the Centre for Future Health, Karen as our research champion for health and wellbeing, I know you've been heavily involved in the organisation, and then our impact managers across the university, Linda, and I think the others, Chris is up there, um, don't know where everybody else is, but they're here. They're the people who manage impact across the university, play a really critical role in making sure we're all thinking about the impact of our research activity outside the ac academic environment and how it impacts on the outside world. Um, and then um, Philip Kerrigan, who is the Centre for Future Health manager and has organised, I think, most of the... Uh, the background organisation for this particular conference. So thank you all for all of that. Um, all I will say to finish then is I hope we'll be having another of these events in about a year's time, and I hope it will be as inspirational as this one has been, and I hope you've all enjoyed it. Please come and join us outside now for a celebratory drink before we all go off for our weekends. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you.